Article 7, from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Meaning of this article. For the glory and adornment of his church Jesus Christ is invested with three eminent offices and functions, those of Redeemer, Mediator, and Judge. Since in the preceding articles it was shown that the human race was redeemed by his passion and death, and since by his ascension into heaven it is manifest that he has undertaken the perpetual advocacy and patronage of our cause, it remains that in this article we set forth his character as judge. The scope and intent of the article is to declare that on the last day Christ the Lord will judge the whole human race. From thence he shall come. The sacred scriptures inform us that there are two comings of the Son of God, the one when he assumed human flesh for our salvation in the womb of the Virgin, the other when he shall come at the end of the world to judge all mankind. This latter coming is called in scripture the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, says the Apostle, shall come, as a thief in the night, and our Lord himself says, of that day and hour no one knoweth, to judge the living and the dead. In proof of the, last, judgment it is enough to adduce the authority of the Apostle, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the proper things of the body, according as he hath done, whether it be good or evil. There are numerous passages of sacred scripture which the pastor will find in various places and which not only establish the truth of the dogma, but also place it in vivid colors before the eyes of the faithful. And if, from the beginning of the world that day of the Lord, on which he was clothed with our flesh, was sighed for by all as the foundation of their hope of deliverance, so also, after the death and ascension of the Son of God, we should make that other day of the Lord the object of our most earnest desires, looking for the blessed hope and coming of the glory of the great God. Two Judgments in explaining this subject the pastor should distinguish two different occasions on which everyone must appear in the presence of the Lord to render in account of all his thoughts, words and actions, and to receive immediate sentence from his judge. The first takes place when each one of us departs this life, for then he is instantly placed before the judgment seat of God, where all that he has ever done or spoken or thought during life shall be subjected to the most rigid scrutiny. This is called the particular judgment. The second occurs when on the same day and in the same place all men shall stand together before the tribunal of their judge, that in the presence and hearing of all human beings of all times each may know his final doom and sentence. The announcement of this judgment will constitute no small part of the pain and punishment of the wicked, whereas the good and just will derive great reward and consolation from the fact that it will then appear what each one was in life. This is called the general judgment. Reasons for general judgment. It is necessary to show why, besides the particular judgment of each individual, a general one should also be passed upon all men. Those who depart this life sometimes leave behind them children who imitate their conduct, dependents, followers and others who admire and advocate their example, language and actions. Now by all these circumstances the rewards or punishments of the dead must needs be increased since the good or bad influence of example, affecting as it does the conduct of many, is to terminate only with the end of the world. Justice demands that in order to form a proper estimate of all these good or bad actions and words a thorough investigation should be made. This, however, could not be without a general judgment of all men. Moreover, as the character of the virtuous frequently suffers from misrepresentation, while that of the wicked obtains the commendation of virtue, the justice of God demands that the former recover, in the public assembly and judgment of all men, the good name of which they had been unjustly deprived before men. Again, as the just and the wicked perform their good and evil actions in this life not without the cooperation of the body, it necessarily follows that these actions belong also to the body as to their instrument. It was, therefore, altogether suitable that the body should share with the soul the due rewards of eternal glory or punishment. But this can only be accomplished by means of a general resurrection and of a general judgment. Next, it is important to prove that in prosperity and adversity, which are sometimes the promiscuous lot of the good and of the bad, everything is done and ordered by an alwise and aljust providence. It was, therefore, necessary not only that rewards should await the just and punishments the wicked, in the life to come, but that they should be rewarded by a public and general judgment. 
thus they will become better known and will be rendered more conspicuous to all, and an atonement for the unwarranted murmurings, to which on seeing the wicked abound in wealth and flourish in honors even the saints themselves, as men, have sometimes given expression, a tribute of praise will be offered by all to the justice and providence of God. My feet, says the prophet, were almost moved, my steps had well nigh slipped, because I had a zeal on occasion of the wicked, seeing the prosperity of sinners, and a little after, behold. These are sinners and yet abounding in the world, they have obtained riches, and I said, then have I in vain justified my heart, and washed my hands among the innocent, and I have been scourged all the day, and my chastisement hath been in the morning. This has been the frequent complaint of many, and a general judgment is therefore necessary, lest perhaps men may be tempted to say that God walketh about the poles of heaven, and regards not the earth. This truth has rightly been made an article of the creed. Wisely, therefore, has this truth been made one of the twelve articles of the Christian creed, so that should any begin to waver in mind concerning the providence and justice of God they might be reassured by this doctrine. Besides, it was right that the just should be encouraged by the hope, the wicked appalled by the terror, of a future judgment, so that knowing the justice of God the former should not be disheartened, while the latter through fear and expectation of eternal punishment might be recalled from the paths of vice. Hence, speaking of the last day, our Lord and Saviour declares that a general judgment will one day take place, and he describes the signs of its approach, that seeing them, we may know that the end of the world is at hand. At his ascension also, to console his apostles, overwhelmed with grief at his departure, he sent angels, who said to them, This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come, as you have seen him going into heaven. Circumstances of the Judgment The Judge That the judgment of the world has been assigned to Christ the Lord, not only as God, but also as man, is declared in Scripture. Although the power of judging is common to all the persons of the Blessed Trinity, yet it is specially attributed to the Son, because to him also in a special manner is ascribed wisdom. But that as man, he will judge the world, is taught by our Lord himself when he says, As the Father hath life in himself, so he hath given to the Son also, to have life in himself, and he hath given him power to do judgment, because he is the Son of Man. There is a peculiar propriety in Christ the Lord sitting in judgment, for sentence is to be pronounced on mankind, and they are thus enabled to see their judge with their eyes and hear him with their ears, and so learn their judgment through the medium of the senses. Most just is it also that he who was most iniquitously condemned by the judgment of men should himself be afterwards seen by all men sitting in judgment on all. Hence when the Prince of the Apostles had expounded in the house of Cornelius the chief dogmas of Christianity, and had taught that Christ was suspended from a cross and put to death by the Jews and rose the third lay to life, he added, and he commanded us to preach to the people, and to testify that this is he, who was appointed of God, to be the judge of the living and the dead. Signs of the General Judgment the sacred scriptures inform us that the general judgment will be preceded by these three principal signs, the preaching of the gospel throughout the world, a falling away from the faith, and the coming of Antichrist. This gospel of the kingdom, says our Lord, shall be preached in the whole world, for a testimony to all nations, and then shall the consummation come. The apostle also admonishes us that we be not seduced by anyone, as if the day of the Lord were at hand. For unless there come a revolt first, and the man of sin be revealed, the judgment will not come. The Sentence of the Just The form and procedure of this judgment the pastor will easily learn from the prophecies of Daniel, the writings of the evangelists and the doctrine of the apostle. The sentence to be pronounced by the judge is here deserving of more than ordinary attention. Looking with joyful countenance on the just standing on his right, Christ our Redeemer will pronounce sentence on them with the greatest benignity, in these words, Come ye blessed of my Father, possess the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world. That nothing can be conceived more delightful to the ear than these words, we shall understand if we only compare them with the condemnation of the wicked, and call to mind, that by them the just are invited from labor to rest, from the veil of tears to supreme joy, from misery to eternal happiness the reward of their works of charity. 
the sentence of the wicked. Turning next to those who shall stand on his left, he will pour out his justice upon them in these words, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. The first words, Depart from me, express the heaviest punishment with which the wicked shall be visited, their eternal banishment from the sight of God, unrelieved by one consolatory hope of ever recovering so great a good. This punishment is called by theologians the pain of loss, because in hell the wicked shall be deprived forever of the light of the vision of God. The words ye cursed, which follow, increase unutterably their wretched and calamitous condition. If when banished from the Divine Presence they were deemed worthy to receive some benediction, this would be to them a great source of consolation. But since they can expect nothing of this kind as an alleviation of their misery, the Divine Justice deservedly pursues them with every species of malediction, once they have been banished. The next words, into everlasting fire, express another sort of punishment, which is called by theologians the pain of sense, because, like lashes, stripes or other more severe chastisements, among which fire, no doubt, produces the most intense pain, it is felt through the organs of sense. When, moreover, we reflect that this torment is to be eternal, we can see at once that the punishment of the damned includes every kind of suffering. The concluding words, which was prepared for the devil and his angels, make this still more clear. For since nature has so provided that we feel miseries less when we have companions and sharers in them who can, at least in some measure, assist us by their advice and kindness, what must be the horrible state of the damned who in such calamities can never separate themselves from the companionship of most wicked demons. And yet most justly shall this very sentence be pronounced by our Lord and Saviour on those sinners who neglected all the works of true mercy, who gave neither food to the hungry, nor drink to the thirsty who refused shelter to the stranger and clothing to the naked, and who would not visit the sick and the imprisoned. Importance of Instruction on this Article These are thoughts which the pastor should very often bring to the attention of his people, for the truth which is contained in this article will, if accepted with faithful dispositions, be most powerful in bridling the evil inclinations of the heart and in withdrawing men from sin. Hence we read in Ecclesiasticus, in all thy works remember thy last end, and thou shalt never sin. And indeed there is scarcely anyone so given over to vice as not to be recalled to virtue by the thought that he must one day render an account before an aljust judge, not only of all his words and actions, but even of his most secret thoughts, and must suffer punishment according to his deserts. On the other hand, the just man will be more and more encouraged to lead a good life. Even though his days be passed in poverty, ignominy and suffering, he must be gladdened exceedingly when he looks forward to that day when, the conflicts of this wretched life being over, he shall be declared victorious in the hearing of all men, and shall be admitted into his heavenly country to be crowned with divine honors that shall never fade. It only remains, then, for the pastor to exhort the faithful to lead holy lives and practice every virtue, that thus they may be enabled to look forward with confidence to the coming of that great day of the Lord nay as becomes children, even to desire it most fervently.